The dynamics of language. What is going on when you listen or speak? Okay, here we have the three layers of human nature, as described by Plato and Aristotle, and even older traditions, such as the six days of creation in Genesis, which is modeled on the same three-layer model. According to this tradition, human nature is rational on top, sensate or animal in the center, and physical or vegetable on the bottom. At the bottom, there's the physical world. We can't do anything with that in language. It's just out there. Similarly, at the top, at the rational layer, we have the fact of our own existence, as well as the existence of other persons, other hypostases, as they might say in theology, or as well as the existence of other principles and values. These two we can't do anything in, with in language. They're just there, too. But it is at the central layer, at the sensate level, that dynamic processes can occur, and, it, and this is where we will st study language. We're going to divide this layer into two halves, the internal senses and the external senses. The internal senses are principally your imagination and your instinct, and the external senses are what most people mean by senses, namely your seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. When we have divide up human nature like this, we discover something very profound. When we look at the objects that occur in each of these le levels, we find a pattern. The lowest physical level is three-dimensional. The external senses are two-dimensional. The internal senses one-dimensional, and rationality is zero-dimensional. Let's think about this a second. Let's give some examples. From math class, what is something that is three-dimensional? Well, a solid. For instance, a cylinder, or in this case, a cube. Okay. From math class, what is something that is two-dimensional? Well, remove a dimension from a solid, and you're left with a flat surface, as any calculus student knows. And so we're going to find that our senses, our external senses, often function in two dimensions. In fact, you can make a case that they always do. Um, smell being the main, maybe the only exception, but that's debatable too if you think about certain animals like moths. Um, when you sense something, it occurs in two dimensions. Think about that. Like when you look out into this room, shut one eye. Does it look, can you see deeply into the room or does it appear like one flat big picture? A picture. Same way, um, shut, your, shut both eyes and listen. Can you hear where something is coming from? Yes, you can. But can you hear how far away it is? Not necessarily. Or touch your neighbor next to you with one finger. Can you feel deeply into, into their body or around the outside of their body to tell how, what, you know, what three-dimensional shape they're in? No, because the part of you that's touching them is only sensing in two dimensions, and so it feels like a flat contact with them, but not a bodily contact with them. Okay, following the pattern, then let's move up to the internal senses. What's something that's one-dimensional? Well, math class, again, take away a dimension from my surface, and what are you left with? A line. And the internal senses, too, function in a straight line. Now, this is not a line in space. It's actually the line of time, the sequence of one thing after another in time. So your internal senses, your imagination and your, in and your instinct, function one-dimensionally as they do one thing after another, after another, after another. This is actually now Im starting to be immaterial. It's not fully immaterial, but it, it's almost full. It's partly immaterial. Um, to become fully immaterial, to totally abstract away from matter in, in every way, you have to go up to the top, the rational layer, and there we find things are zero-dimensional. Now, what is something that's zero-dimensional again? From math, take away to start with a line and take away its only dimension. What are you left with? A point. A singularity, something infinitely small. In other words, something that has no meaningful existence in this three-dimensional world that we're used to. So, when we think of our own spirit or the, or the principle of our existence or the principle of like the Pythagorean theorem, 
All of these have no extension in space. They're ideas. They are. They don't occur in time even either. So they have no existence in space or time. They just exist. That's all they have, the fact of their existence. And so these ideas may not seem by much, but like much, but we're going to find that these are actually the most profound parts of our nature. Because since it has no space, you can pack an infinitely great amount of stuff into that little point. And it is amazing that our mind can comprehend this. But anyways, dispensing with that, we are left with this, this um, pattern of human nature in three dimensions, two dimensions, one dimension, and zero dimensions. Let's start at the rational le level. On the left here, we have ideas, also known as concepts or principles. For instance here, the idea of cubicness. Um, we're going to find that cubicness contributes its content, its form, its essence, it, its, its inner value to any instance of a cube anywhere in the world, anywhere in time or someone's senses or in the physical world even that cubes exist. So whenever you know a cube, then your concept of cubicness is naming or infusing into that physical thing that, that's in three dimensions. Likewise, on the right here, which in pink, which represents will instead of intellect, which was blue, here in pink, we have the value of goodness. A value is the equivalent of a concept, except that it has a little bit extra um, content that is attractable to your will that makes you like it or love it or hope for it or some some willful action towards it. And here we're going to here too we're going to find that the concept or the value of goodness also infuses its content into good things wherever they exist. But it doesn't do it essentially. For instance, if there is a good ice cream cone over there, essentially it's an ice cream cone. We wouldn't say that it is essentially good. We just say it's essentially an ice cream cone and is incidentally, or philosophers might say accidentally good. And since this incidental or accidental designation or naming or infusing of the concept into the thing is only incidental and accidental rather than essential, we're going to draw that with just a dotted line so that you know that it's not as important as the intellectual heft on the left. Okay, let's move down to the sensate level, and this is where language is finally going to begin to occur. Speaking, not just thinking. Um, suppose one day, long ago, the first man, we'll say Adam, saw a square salt object on the ground and decided to make up a word for it. And suppose his word was cube. I'm sure it wasn't. It was probably an ancient language that no longer cube. exists. But we'll just cube. say it was cube. That, And so every time Adam would see one of these things and wanted to indicate it, he would say cube, 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 and pointing at a cube every time he says this. Now, as he's doing this, obviously his wife is probably thinking to herself, um, what's this crazy sound that... Adam is now spouting off about every time he turns a corner. And she would have taken that sound. Now, she doesn't have the instinct to say it herself yet, but she would have heard the sound and absorbed it into her mind. And in that dark space within her mind's eye, which we call the imagination, she would have worked over that sound and Cube. thought about what Adam was indicating by means of that sound. So what it probably is applied, is meaning, what it's applying to, how, in, under what circumstances it's being used, where, when does he use it. And she would have slowly grown to associate the sound cube with that physical thing over there. Cube. You know, Adam, animals can do that much. They make a certain sound for when the humans are coming or when the prey is drawing near. Um, so now they, these sounds don't have content, don't have rational content the way ours do. 
so they're uh, so they're very much darkened from our words but they still indicate the physical thing that they apply to so um, there you have the f two co the two faculties of the of internal sensation instinct which is automatic and spontaneous and in producing um, sounds and imagination which is um, takes things in and works them over and examines them from all angles to find out their extent deep in the dark space within your mind's eye and so each of these is useful in language one for speaking the other for um, listening and coming to understand. And consequently, they were function in different ways in the um, hierarchy of being that um, our nature is constituted in. First, let's start on the instinct side. What does the sound cube do in relation to that square salt thing on the ground over there? Well, as we found in the last slide, it designates or names that salt thing. So whenever I say cube, there had better be a salt square thing nearby. Not salt, but just a square three-dimensional thing nearby, or I am speaking falsely, wrongly, inappropriately. Um, so the, the sound contributes its meaning. It contributes its sense, its content to the physical thing and makes that physical thing a little bit brighter so that instead of just being a shape to my eyes it's now also a trigger to my to the sound in my brain okay that's what the sound does but now let's take it a step higher to the rational level what does the concept do in relation to the sound and or the physical thing well, we're going to find the exact same thing. Just as the sound designates or names the physical, so the concept designates or names everything below it, both the sound and the physical object. Now, be careful here, though. A concept is much finer than a sound. A concept has internal content that means something definite, always and everywhere. So when we know or think a concept into a sound that we have made, um, it illuminates that sound and makes it suddenly understandable. And the same thing when we see a physical object and think our concept into that physical object, into that salt thing over there. It's not just a salt, um, shapey thing. It's a cube. That's, that's a profound thing. And so our concept designates or names or contributes its essence to both the sound cube and to the physical three-dimensional object below it, which is an amazing thing. Okay, now going over to the willful side. What does the imagination of the sound what is the imagination cube or imagination of cube with that thing in my mind, that shape in my mind's eye? What does that imagination do in relation to the concept higher than it? It doesn't name that concept because nothing lower can do anything to something that's higher than it. It can't impact it in any way. No, but there is one thing that our sound, imagined sound cube can do. It can refer to that concept. Notice it doesn't affect the concept, it just refers to it impersonally, hands off, but from a distance refers to it. We might use a better word than just refer. It signifies the concept. So whenever I say cube, I am signifying the concept of equilateral three-dimensional so solidness, square solidness. Or you might even say means three-dimensional three equilateral squareness. So on the left, we have instinct. On the right, we have imagination. On the left, we have naming and designating. 
and infusing, whereas on the right we have signifying and meaning. And this, these trends, these kinds of references of one thing higher to something higher or lower will be seen in future slides. Returning now to our his history of the evolution of language, then one day, many years after Adam, probably in the regions of Sumeria or Egypt, after people had been saying cube, 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 cube all over the place, something new happened. What do you think happened? Well, someone got the bright idea to make a little picture or a written representation of that sound. And, the, and writing occurred. The earliest written words were hieroglyphs. What do you think the word glyph means? Well, if you guess something having to do with writing, you're right. It means imprint or indentation, because the earliest words were imprints into wax or clay tablets. They were like little pictures that symbolized the several linguistic sounds that were already widely used in that language. If you drew a boot, it meant make the b sound. If you drew an ox, it meant make like the little upside down a an ox's head with the two legs being horns. It meant make the ah sound, which became the Hebrew aleph, eventually our a. And then to tell someone to stop making sounds because the idea was complete, you drew a little oval around it, and that was called a cartouche, the same thing as our word for word or name. So in Egypt and Sumeria, people started making little phonetic pictures of their already spoken words. And what did each little picture signify? Did it directly signify the sound that a sheep makes? No, it's not a picture of that. Rather, it's just a picture of b and a. Ah. Maybe b and a ah mean something completely different in Sumerian and Egyptian. I don't know. So the writing first signified the sound because and then secondarily, once the person hears the sound in their mind, then the sound can signify the concept. But first, the writing only signifies the, the sound. Now let's think about the person's hand moving here. Do you know which sensate faculty that person is using? That person is using their motor faculty. Motor means moving. So anytime you move your muscles, you are, for instance, to write, you are using your motor faculty. And that occurs externally, outside your mind, doesn't it? Muscles are always outside your mind. So therefore, we draw it down here in the lower half of the sensate level as an external sense, because you are, in fact, feeling yourself right as you write. <laughs> so that's where it goes. Now, let's think about, now that we have speaking and writing, let's think about what designates what. First, what does the writing designate or name? Well, it designates the object, doesn't it? If I took a sticky tag with C-U-B-E and stuck it on an actual cube on the table, you would say that I had correctly designated it or named it, wouldn't you? And what does the sound designate or name? Well, primarily it designates the writing. When I come to a pit sign on the wall and, sit and, a, and I behold the letters E, B, U, C in reverse, if I then say cube, you will say, say that I'm correct, that I have correctly designated or named that picture on the wall. Indirectly, the sound can also designate the actual physical, physical object. I can point at a cube and say, cube, and no writing is needed at all. So the sound can, sign can designate or name either of the two media formats below it, either the writing or the physical. Lastly, what does the concept cubicness de designate or name? Well, 
the concept cubicness designates or names or infuses its content, if you haven't guessed already, into all three. It enters into each one of them, the sound, the writing, and the object, and in each one of these it contributes its inner content or meaning, thereby illuminating the sound and giving, or the writing, or the object, and giving it understanding so that when I see that object over there, I can immediately think, oh, this thing contains all the properties that I know from geometry class apply to equilateral six-sided solidness, such as um, all of its vertices are equidistant from the center. Things like, um, oh, this is the building block of buildings. So any th the very highest format, highest media, the, the concept, in a most wonderful sense, illuminates the lower medias to, as it inf contributes its meaning into that. And having done that, we're ready now to consider the problem of learning language. Because now we have learned how to produce language, now we have to figure out how do people learn language? And we will do that in the next slide. Well, now that a scribe had invented writing, what do you think happened next? Well, Pharaoh came along, and he saw that little cartouche written on the wall, and what do you think he did? He asked, what's that little cartoon, or cartouche mean? And what does it mean? It means the sound cube. Well, Pharaoh knew the word cube, so what do you think Pharaoh did after he heard that? He imagined that little squiggle, that piece of writing, which he was seeing on the written page, and then he imagined the sound coming from it. And he imagined the word again, and he imagined the sound coming cube. from it. Cube. You'll have to do this to him, too, if you learn a language. And he did this lots of times at, until it became natural that the picture on the page would trigger the sound in his mind. And, you know, there were little shortcuts, too, to make it easy for him. Like the k was a cup. The u was, an, was drawn as an ubis bird. The b was drawn as a boot. And the silent e was a leaf blowing in the wind. So Pharaoh didn't even have to remember all 50,000 glyphs of each of the English language's words. No, he just had to remember the 27 glyphs, each glyph triggering the phonic sound of that letter. Finally, he'd get all the sounds into his imagination, and then he'd know what the word was. So, did the squiggles, the writing, directly trigger the concept? No, as we said before, they triggered the sound in his mind and the sound itself later triggered the concept. Pretty soon, when Pharaoh would see cup, ubis, bird, boot, and leaf, he wasn't, even, he wasn't even imagining the sound anymore. What do you think he was imagining now? He was imagining a picture of an actual cube, the one he had seen before. And at other times, when he would see cup, ubis, boot, leaf, he might imagine both the picture and the sound together. It was a little confusing Cute. sometimes because they didn't quite fit together and so they would kind of get in the way of his intention. But it all it worked quite well. Seeing Kapubis boot leaf, you think cube. In whatever way you want. So that's the fourth sensate faculty. Sensation. <laughs> and notice here. If I'm deaf and dumb, and I hold up one of these six-sided equilateral solids, these cubes, because I want to signify something to you, what does it mean or represent or signify? Well, it means any one of the three above it. It, it could mean the writing, C-U-B-E, or the sound cube, or the concept, six-sided equilateralness. So think about that. A physical thing can signify any one of the higher entities above it. 
I could, after all, make a sentence by laying out an eyeball and a little heart symbol and a U. And what sentence would that imply? Well, if as a little kid you did these kinds of exercises, you know that it meant this, the sentence, I love you. That's a very significative sentence, isn't it? So, the lowest physical, physical objects can signify anything above them. They can act as signs in an unlimited way. Next, what does the written word signify? That's right. It signifies the sound and the concept. And finally, what does the sound signify? It signifies just the concept. We can forget about accidental signification, can't we? Because only for a very few people would saying cube make them immediately think of goodness. So let's move on. So now we have finally made the complete circle and filled up the sensate level. Let's put it all together. How does a word come to become commonly used by more and more people? First, someone says it. Then someone writes it. Cube. Then someone senses it. And then they imagine it. And the more they Cube. imagine it, what do you think happens? Well, it becomes instinctive again, and the circle com continues. So the circle goes around and around again. Language gets posited by some and picked up by others, and posited by them and picked up by others still. And it goes on and on, whether it's a single word or a complete sentence or an extended thought, idea, or discourse. Language always spreads in the same way using these faculties. And this occurs by means of the two big processes that occur in our world, intellect and will. First, intellect. Via intellect, what does language do? Language evolves over time, originally from thought, then into sounds as people learn to communicate their thoughts to one another, and ultimately down into writing as people learn to communicate in absentia, for instance, by mail, when they cannot physically speak to another person. And through what processes does this occur? Through designation and naming, that is, the expression of higher forms, either thinking or speaking, down into lower media, either speaking or writing, or even down into physical objects. This last stage occurs when things become set in stone because they were physically put into act, into reality. For instance, someone did as the, they were commanded in an instruction, or a recipe was cooked up as written on the card, or a building was made real as indicated on its blueprints. And so what do the higher objects do to the lower objects in all this? Look carefully. Did you see it? That's right. They name or designate them. Next, let's consider will. On the willful side, what happens? Lower objects trigger, elicit, remind, signify, or mean higher sounds or ideas and those higher sounds then trigger, elicit, remind, signify, or mean the higher ideas. So whenever someone is learning a new word or learning a language or just reading from a book something that they had forgotten or never learned before, the pictures mean the sounds and the sounds mean the ideas. So there you have it. That's how language works. Now let's draw some conclusions for our language classes. First, in our class, do you think we're going to focus on passively receiving language or on actively producing language? Well, which is harder? Producing, of course, because if you have a choice to 
to hear or to speak, which would you rather do? Obviously, to speak is much harder than to hear. So therefore, in our language classes, we're going to focus on passively, not on passively listening, but on actively speaking. Because if all you can do is listen, do you think you're going to be able to start speaking one day? I wouldn't count on it. Second, I want you to focus on the three levels here, or four levels in the diagram. Do you think we should focus on the oral levels of language, speaking and listening, or on the written language levels of language, read, reading and writing? Well, which, again, which is harder, to read and write or to speak and listen? If you've ever gone to another country, I'm sure you know that when you when you hear da 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 da, it's magnitudes harder to learn to speak and listen than it is to read and write. So in our language classes, we should try to get good at hearing words and phrases, and then saying and he those words and phrases, so so that they become instantaneous. Because when we do that, then we will be able to read and write with ease. But if all we ever learn to do is to read and write, do you think we're going to be able to pipe up and start speaking one day? I wouldn't count on it. So therefore, in our language classes, we should focus on speaking and listening. And of those two in particular, on speaking, because that is the active faculty. Because if you learn to speak a language, you will by sure be able to do the other three faculties as well reading, writing, and listening. Because that's, after all, what language is, isn't it? It's oral, right from the beginning, wasn't it? 